Sure. Listen to how Trump says he will help farmers. So the first thing I do is I would probably my first call, I'm going to call up President Xi. I'm going to say you have to honor the deal you made. We made a deal. You'd buy 50 billion dollars worth of American farm product. And I guarantee you he will buy it 100 percent. He will buy it. Wait a minute, Todd. That is not free trade. That is forced trade. That's Trump's way of dealing with China. I, I know you don't like the overall concept of not going through the free markets. But at the end of the day, this is a deal that was negotiated between the United States and China. I would argue that that is somewhat free market-ish. And so to the overall point, Donald Trump saying, I'm going to enforce the deal that we made. I don't have too much of a problem with it. He ain't no free trader. Yo, get your 30 seconds worth in. The only reason he's promised that to the farmers is because China had retaliated in the trade deal when we first imposed into free markets. And so then as a makeup to them, he had to force China to buy soybeans. So to Todd's point, the problem with the free market thing here is once you intervene, you intervene again and again and again. We're supposed to know better. I stand against it, even though Trump's economic plan is vastly better than Kamala's. This part is not. You got 45 seconds. No, that was 22 there. seconds. I counted while I was talking. Oh, get out of here. All right, a nice try. Nice try. Let's have a look at the markets. How are they performing on this Tuesday morning? A little bit of green. The rally very modestly continues. David Barnson. What drive? I'm, I'm going to call it a rally, and I think I'm right. I mean, the market has gone up, records for S&P and the Dow. What's driving it? Well, the big rally that's been going on has been going on for about 200 years, and yeah. it's called free enterprise. But you know what I mean. You and know in I mean. the specific month, we've had a big recovery from when we sold off at the end of July, early August. Uh, it's a combination. Profits were good last quarter, right. and multiples have still expanded. So we're just having a very expensive market in the process of getting more expensive. Got it. Okay. Now, now, I want to talk to you about the work from home. I'm going to call it an experiment. Uh, you've been saying for a while that it was never going to work. Well, look, Amazon trying to bring back their executives, their employees, five days a week. My question is, how far is the push against remote work going to go? It's going to go huge. It's going all the way. Every big woke company that bragged about it, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Google, Netflix, they've all gone back on it. Everyone. And this thing with Amazon is not just executives. It's all employees who work in an office. So the warehouses were already there. And now they're saying everyone else come back. And it's not three days a week. It's five days a week. And the reason why is because human beings work best together, communicating facial expressions. And I'm telling you, the lack of mentorship that was being subject to these uh, that these younger employees were having to go through not having older people to talk into them in the office it was unfair they're remedying it now but if you're an outstanding employee working remotely you don't want to be forced back to the office. You may well leave and go to someplace else where your talents are credited. OK, well, I look forward to seeing that. Who has that leverage in this uh, labor environment that we're going into? I can't say specifically who, but there are going to be outstanding employees who don't like this. I do not believe that there will be at any real scale. And people have been saying this for four years. The talent was going to leave. J.P. Morgan's had no trouble hiring. My company is very small, but not, not a single person has ever pushed back. And we've been five days a week in office for four Four years. There's Lauren. a TikTok trend called corporate girly. It's about Gen Z getting dolled up and going to work. You and I would say, why romanticize something that you do every day? But for that generation, it's foreign. It's changing. Yep. They're going back to work and they're starting to like the stability of a routine that they're posting about but it. Remote work's not going to die out completely. Not completely. It? It, was, it existed before COVID. What's going to die out completely is the people that previously went to work that then were told, okay, I guess you don't have to anymore. But the job really lent itself to being in the office. It lent itself to being in front of your customers, in front of your coworkers, in front of your bosses. If you're, you talk about a really good employee, a superstar, if you're 26 years old and you're a superstar, and no one sees you be a superstar, how does that help you? You need to be visible to the people around you. All right, we got it. Uh, now this, we just got the latest read on, well, it's not the latest, it is a read on home prices. Remember, these numbers are from July, so they're two months old. What are the numbers? But the trend is our friend. Prices are cooling. They rose 5.9% on an annual basis in July, and that was the smallest increase since November of 2023. So slowly... Prices are coming down. Stop. He's laughing. He's laughing. Chuckling. But prices Chuckling. aren't coming down. You, that, well, that's what the data says. Of the 20 big no, cities No, it says the rate of at. increase is going down. Okay. Prices are going up, but at a slower pace than before. The smallest increase since November. I'm saying if we have an affordability crisis, them getting a little bit more unaffordable 
at a lower rate than before is still difficult. Like prices need to come down. And as in New in York, some, they're up 8.8 percent. That's right. They certainly Just are. for you. You're such a pay in Barnson. Uh, coming up, the Ella. I didn't really mean. I know, but I mean it. I think I'm a pay. Yeah, sure. I was actually having flashbacks to what my wife has recently said. But. Oh, there you go. David Barnson sitting next to me, looking at Microsoft, shaking his head, nodding his head. What's, what's wrong with Microsoft? You know how rare it is that you look at a stock that has a lower, excuse me, a higher PE next year than this year? So how is that possible if they're going to grow earnings? The earnings growth is slowing at Microsoft. They're trading at 41 times next year's earnings, but 37 times this year's earnings. So? Earnings is slowing, and you have to trade. You have to if you bought the stock right now, and they don't change earnings at all. You get your money back in forty-one years. Mm, that's a, not a nice the whole market. point uh, to the prior guest to your argument: Microsoft has a ton of profits. It's a huge, wonderful, successful company that you are paying a fortune to buy right now. A fortune. Okay. Are you on this show again in the near future? I have no doubt that I will be. You've not been booked yet, have you? No, but you will forget what I just said <laughs> by the next commercial break. <laughs> Probably. Uh, why is Tesla up this morning? Put it on the screen because it's up again. What is that? That's uh, one point set. 253. Yeah. Why? And they are turning positive for the year. So this is after a report from Barclays showing that for the third quarter deliveries, they're now expecting about 470,000 deliveries. The estimate was for 460,000. So coming in a little bit better than expected. And Tesla, again, finally positive here for the year. Have you got anything negative to say about Tesla this morning? Well, it's not something we would buy because of not being a dividend payer, but it's just a highly um, up and down type stock. It's very volatile. I could not imagine owning Tesla unless you were just committed to it as a very long term play. You got to ignore all the up and down movements. It's way down from its high two years a ago. A former relative of mine says you are indeed a pain. Well, <laughs> just a point. OK, Salesforce, they've got an upgrade. <laughs> don't worry, David. Don't I worry. know who don't it worry. is. <laughs> don't tell her I said no, no, you don't. No, you don't. <laughs> Salesforce got an upgrade. I want to know about John Deere, because Trump is threatening them with a 200% tariff. We've done this story before, but mm -hmm. what's it all about? If they move production to Mexico, which they have tried to shift some of that production out of facilities in Iowa, which has caused layoffs. So he told John Deere, if you want to continue to do that and go to Mexico, then anything you don't make here in the U.S., you will have a 200 percent tariff because moving out of the United States is bad for farmers and it's bad for manufacturing. And that's just a terrible thing, isn't it, David? Well, I mean, you have an awful lot of companies that do some manufacturing out of the country. So to go target one particular company, as opposed to the whole broad economy, is called crony capitalism. And I'm totally against it. Yes, but it's good politics, isn't it? Um, it may very well be. We'll see. <laughs> OK. That doesn't make it right policy, though. Uh, let's get to a different area with you, David. How about your famous dividend picks? Something we can agree on. Yes. Uh, look at it. Morgan Stanley, you think that's a good dividend payout? It's a 3.8 percent dividend yield, the highest in the financial sector. They were a 0 percent dividend payer for the entire time I worked there. I was a managing director at the firm, full disclosure, for almost 10 years. I left and started my own company 10 years ago. And when I left, I figured the stock would have to go way down with me not there anymore. They've really <laughs> done a great job. They've executed very well. I say that obviously joking. Uh, Stuart, 3.8%. And the CEO is a brand new CEO, Ted Pick, very committed to dividend growth. They have a ton of free cash flow. It's sustainable. They're not the same Morgan Stanley from before the financial crisis, where they were dependent on all these mortgage bonds and stuff with their own okay. balance sheet. They just get a lot of annuitized revenue, a lot of consistent fees so they can keep growing the dividend. Do they do well as interest rates come down? Um, they do, as a matter of fact. There's a number of areas in their business that benefit from lower rates, yes. 3.8%? And growing. I'm Morgan Stanley? Not yes, bad. I'll get, I think we're in agreement on this one, David. Good. We're back in our good graces. We I can come back on the show? Possibly. All right, David. No tax on tips, Social Security benefits on overtime, restore the deduction for state and local taxes, cap interest rates on credit cards at 10%. There's a plan for you from Trump. What do you make of it? Most of it I really disagree with, but I love the plan from his first term, lower taxes for businesses, um, bringing a lot of money back on shore, for open energy, independent energy policy, and deregulation. I'd focus on that. But pandering on certain targeted tax cuts is not the Reaganite way. It's not the conservative way. The 10% price fixing on credit cards just means less people get approved for credit cards. There's unintended consequences to intervening in these things. He's not I like a, a lot of what he's doing, but not all of it. He's not a Ronald Reagan. That's a fact. That's Trip. All right, David, thank you. David, I want to thank you for being with me for the hour. You put up with me and I put up with you. Enjoyed Not bad. it very much. <laughs> yes, indeed.